Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if we could uh, make a start. Firstly, welcome to the university, those of you who are from uh, outside the University of Plymouth. I'm uh, Mark Cleary, I'm acting Vice-Chancellor. I've got the dubious privilege of uh, <laughs> trying to introduce Peter Shears this evening. That's always a risky venture. And it's even risky when he gives you a, a sort of potted biography which you know will be a work of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Probably including half of the gags that he wants to use this evening. Um, seriously, it, it, it really is a pleasure to see so many people here uh, to uh, celebrate uh, Peter's uh, elevation to the peerage, if you like, and to, to listen to his inaugural lecture. Very intriguing title. I'm not going to read the whole of the biography, uh, perhaps just pick out one or two things. Um, Peter was born, I think it was about 98 years ago. Uh, <laughs> Cornish stock, he tells me, he actually lived in London uh, in his youth, but always came back to, uh, to Cornwall and to the southwest. Um, the usual misspent youth, it would appear that Peter spent most of his time either chasing women um, or acting as a, a member of the, the National Youth Theatre, so uh, nothing has changed. His first degree, English Literature, Economics and Law, and then uh, did a postgraduate programme in uh, radio, film and television studies. So clearly um, an affinity for the stage and an affinity for the, the public arena, which I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, this evening. He then took a, a law degree in, in two years um, from the University of London, obviously went into, into teaching law. He's been at Plymouth, I think, since uh, 1979. So it's a, certainly a, a long-serving member um, of the institution. And I think it's fair to say has been a, a real rock in terms of looking after the group, developing the law group. Um, I think it's, I came across Peter really probably about four years ago. And despite sort of meeting and talking to Peter, still felt it was worthwhile trying to develop the, the law. <laughs> um, I think one of the features of, of Peter's work, and one of the things that, that really does make it worthwhile celebrating um, his, uh, his chair, is the two dimensions of what he does. He's clearly um, a well-published scholar in terms of his area, particularly of consumer law, both in terms of, of books and academic papers. And that's an important part of, uh, of what he does, an important part of his profile. I think the second thing that stands out is the work that he's done, uh, television, radio, newspapers, if you like, the, uh, the softer academic side, where he really has played a big role, um, both in uh, projecting his own very distinctive personality, uh, no doubt we'll see more of that this evening, but also in the area of consumer law. Um, since 1997, he's been a, a DTI nominated member of the regulatory body for property lawyers, the uh, uh, Council for Licensed Conveyances. And he's also, I think, played a, a big role in highlighting some of the uh, problems in consumer law, some of the more interesting dimensions of it um, over the last 10 years. And I think his, uh, his, his chair is a, a deserved reflection of both of those aspects of his work. And it's certainly been uh, a great privilege for the university to have somebody like Peter developing both the academic work, but also playing an important part in terms of the, the public <coughs> profile uh, of law in the region and nationally. The final bit of information he gave me was that within the last few weeks, he's joined a small team working on an EU project. I think only Peter could really carry this one off which is based in Be Beirut and administered from Northern Ireland. <laughs> uh, that's just such a great combination. Uh, I'm not sure it's the consumer's right to be stupid. <laughs> but uh, very welcome to, to everybody here. Delighted to be here and to, uh, to welcome Peter, to welcome everybody to his inaugural lecture, Enforcing the Consumer's Right to be Stupid. Peter, thanks very much. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Mark Cleary. 
<laughs> uncharacteristically generous <laughs> and leaving at the end of the month. <laughs> I'm almost humbled by the attendance this evening. People have come from everywhere. This man here has come up from Australia. Four people have come from Atlanta. Ladies come from upstate New York. Guys coming from the Netherlands. Perhaps most surprisingly, half a dozen people from the Salt Ash Rugby Club. <laughs> <laughs> All over the country, people have come for a reason that escapes me completely. I hope you'll be able to stay. It's going to be something of a reception outside. And if you haven't got to go, uh, the proprietors of Seymour Arm, that are five minutes away from here, have insisted on putting on a further reception. And you may not know where the Seymour Arms is. Therefore, out near the wine glasses, there are maps. <laughs> okay, let's get on with it. Just so as you know, the extent of scholarship you can reasonably expect. <laughs> A girl of six sliced open her finger on the prize she won in a safety awareness competition. <laughs> Charlotte Buck was hurt as she pulled a teddy bear from a tin posted to her by Care Laboratories, who made the satellite antiseptic. The youngster from Basingstoke also won a first aid kit, <laughs> which had to be used to treat the one and a half inch gash. The firm was yesterday fined £800. Featuring twin rotating panels, you'll watch as exotic fish swim in unison against a wall of moving coral, creating a fascinating underwater illusion without water. <laughs> £25, but as a gift for this, and we get through. As a gift certificate, Holder, you will only pay eight pounds. <laughs> Performs a full rendition, a horrible concept, of Gene <laughs> Kelly singing in the rain with toe tapping action, full arm movement with umbrella, <laughs> dressed in an attractive yellow raincoat and matching hat. As a gift certificate holder, you will only pay three ninety nine. Just in case you're desperate to become a gift certificate owner. You know that you can spend up to a thousand English pounds on this stuff. It's not just goods. This is 15 years old. Non-surgical facelifting. A business opportunity. But 15 years ago, 7,000 English pounds. Last week, on a plane to Beirut, that is true. <laughs> This is the sort of thing that the representatives of the local rugby club will be pleased to find, from fat to flat. Some of us have further to go than others. But here, prices from 15,500. <laughs> now I want you to notice that you buy one and get one free, that's enabling you to... <laughs> Tell me that's not Sue Lawley. <laughs> Consumers have a right to be daft. But they have no obligation to be cheated. They have no obligation to be ripped off, misled, con. There's to be a new law very soon, which will be addressing a lot of the stories, the scams that I've been dealing with for 20 years, 25 years. Now, this law comes from Europe from the European Union, so you know it's going to have a snappy title.
<laughs> we'll be calling it the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. It's designed to harmonise consumer protection across 27 member states. It's designed to level the playing field for businesses and for consumers. It's designed to encourage people to believe in and use the internal market. And its impact on UK law will be extraordinary. There are 28 sets of legislation that will need to be amended. For the first time, businesses will be obliged not to trade unfairly. Interestingly, not a duty to be fair, then you'd have to define what that means, but a duty not to be unfair. It's going, and you're going to have to face this briefly, to be written in a foreign, strange language called Eurospeak. But we'll try and get a handle on it. We'll oblige businesses not to mislead consumers through acts or omissions. To leave off the high pressure selling. We're supposed to have the regulations next month. It's supposed to come into force at the end of the year. My friend Jemima says, you may get the regs in the last week of May, but they won't be enforced until next April. We will be late. Let's hope the French don't notice. <laughs> now then, here come some European law. Fasten your seatbelts, put your tray in an upright position, and your seats back. Directive covers business to consumer. Activity, not business to business, not a trading thing. It's about the way in which you treat your consumers. It'll be outlawed to mess with the economic behaviour of consumers. If you materially distort it, like economic behaviour, deciding whether or not to buy, deciding whether or not to demand a refund, deciding whether or not to exercise a right to cancel. To materially distort, that means to appreciably impair the consumer's ability to make an informed decision. A transactional decision, how and what terms to purchase, make payment in whole or in part, retain, dispose, decide to do nothing. Unfair commercial practices will be illegal. What is a commercial practice? Omission, course of conduct, including advertising, marketing, directly concerned with the promotion. And what is unfair commercial practice? Contrary to the requirements of professional diligence, an ill-defined concept, and materially distorting economic behaviour, the consumer or the average member of a group. Okay, that's the end of that sum. It is not uncommon for businesses, particularly rogue traders, to target individual groups of consumers. You can make the same profit, maybe more profit, by targeting a small group heavily than by targeting a huge group lightly. A money circulation scan in Birmingham, based on the religious sensitivities, <coughs> it was called Galaxy Lifestyles, conned these people using their religious beliefs into believing they could make £91,000, charging them £1,700 for 10 years and £3,500 <coughs> before it was closed down. 
This directive has an organised structure. There will be a general prohibition. This is the harmonisation. Within that, it's particularly targeting misleading practices and aggressive practices. And within that, there is a list of 31 different activities, each and all of which will be offences. So the general prohibition, that's the, the green bit, is the element designed to achieve the harmonisation. Moving from that to misleading and aggressive, because it's my view that whilst you... Uh, you don't have to be misleading or aggressive. The kind of practice that we're targeting is likely to be one or the other. <coughs> misleading commercial practices, misleading through content, <coughs> the characteristics, the identity, the availability, the price of a product. <coughs> For example, the magic of 99. This is an outfit that I had a hand in closing down about 18 years ago <coughs> called Magna Marketing. The scam was you would get a brand new car every year, a kind of a lease, and you would only pay £99. The deal was that you would get your car the moment that the whole of it had been covered by advertising. They were going to sell advertising on cars and then let you have the car for £99 for a year and then next year give you another one. There were, of course, certain terms and conditions. <laughs> one of which makes it perfectly clear that until they sold the advertising on the car, you won't get it. And what they did was to set the advertising rate so high there was no possibility that you would ever sell the advertising on the car. No car was ever supplied. And all these people, hundreds and hundreds of people, lost 99 pounds. Now I believe that if they take you for 99, you'll kind of shrug. If they take you for 100, you'll be after them. The magic of 99. This, of course, you've all seen by email in hard copy, the so-called Nigerian letter. Uh, most of them aren't from Nigeria at all. Many of them originate in this country. But Nigeria was feeling the heat. And so the central <coughs> bank took full page newspaper advertisements saying, don't do it. Based, of course, on simple greed. Believing that you're going to get the lion's share of some phone number. Of money. But it's not new. Back in 1994, I had a hand in closing this lockdown. This was uh, a letter saying, look, I know of a firm of solicitors who are looking to hand out a load of estate money to people with your surname. And I'm prepared to tell you the name of that firm of solicitors, but you've got to give me £19.50 for it. Seems like a reasonable investment. £19.50, I cop the lot. Error. What happens is, you pay them £19.50. And that's really all that happens. That was 1994. This was this week, last Monday. Is it a United, with all due respect to my guests, a United States Assurance Company? There's an outfit, they say, to a Monaco Heritage Fund. They've got all this money, and they want to give you some. And you've been nominated as a potential recipient. They junk mailed 126,000 people in this country. And a lot more in America. <coughs> now this outfit, with all this money, only wants you to send them £24. They've got all this money and they need your £24. To cover administrative costs. 2,000 people in this country fell for it. This is a delightful story. At the BBC, I got a phone call from a guy saying, I'm not going on the air with this, but I think you should know about it. 
in the pubs in Plinton, just outside of Plinton. A couple of likely lads with a suitcase. Yeah. Look, stick this in the wall. Stick your phone link into it, and it won't get registered at the exchange. Free phone call. 25 quid. And this guy phoned up, left his detail message saying, I fell for it. I think I was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'll drop it round because I don't want to be seen with it. And I don't want to be named as having fallen for it. I showed it to a BBC engineer and he said, that's clever. When you look at this, there's a little bit of something in there and it looks like it might be different. But it's a, I don't know what diode is, but he said it's a diode. And it really won't have much effect on anything because what you're dealing with is a BBC, uh, a BT adapter. <laughs> and of course, for three bucks, you've got your neighbours in phoning up their relatives in New Zealand, and then you get the bill. <laughs> but it's such a perfect con. You're never going to see those guys again, but even if you do, what are you going to do? You are you going to say to them, well, that fat idiot on the radio says, that when I buy something, it's got to be of satisfactory quality. Within the terms of section 14, subsection 2 of the Safe Goods Act 1979, as amended, it's got to be reasonably fit for the purpose or purposes for which goods of that kind are commonly supplied, i.e. ripping off BT. <laughs> it's perfect. That I like. That is a clean con, and you deserve all you get. <laughs> now, I had, over a period of about five years, a lot of examples of this one. The statement is, now it's a pleasure to wear tights. I'm going to leave that thought with you. <laughs> but what I got was people coming saying, look, they sent me this, but they also sent me a bill. How can that be true? Well, it is true, and it says here, to get your free pair, we're going to send you two pairs and a bill for the other pair, and every four or five weeks we're going to keep sending them to you until you say you don't want any more. Now, they're a perfectly okay company, and for all I know, I can't get the size, I can get the colours. <laughs> perfectly okay, as far as these things go. It's not misleading. If you read the words on the can, you see free, and you think it is. See under lunch. <laughs> so, misleading through content, misleading through confusion, misleading through breaching codes of practice, Misleading through leaving stuff out. This is quite nice. This, the advent period of, of this new directive, there's been a lot of comment in um, theatre newspapers. Um, dealing with, you know those, those phrases you get outside the theatre that encourage you to go inside the theatre because it's such a jolly good show. Proclaiming something along the lines of intellectually stimulating. Whereas, in fact, what the review said, this would have been intellectually stimulating <laughs> had the play not been completely miscast in this direction. <laughs> so next time you see that outside the theatre, I laughed like a drain. You've got to ask yourself, why? <laughs> so, the general prohibition, the harmonisation idea. Within that, misleading practices and aggressive practices. What's that? Harassment, coercion, force, violence, significantly impairing the average consumer's freedom of choice or conduct in regard to the product, and thereby causes him, would likely to cause him, do you remember this expression, transactional decision, he would not have taken otherwise. A couple of stories I'm working on at the moment. Oh, these things are the factors, you know, fairly obvious, timing, location, threat to take action, they can't leave you take. There's a girl phones up two weeks ago, and she's called Teresa, and she's phoning under her office desk, because she's been told not to make phone calls. 
and she's listening to the radio with her earpiece in one ear. She says, my friend Frances is an old, frail and unwell woman and she's getting nasty letters and she's getting despicable phone calls and she's on the point of suicide. We demand, the sum stated, sent direct to this office immediately your failure to comply, debt collector, county court judgment, little old lady, it will not do. I dropped them a line. I said, and she phoned me up off, off air. I said, what's this about? She said, well, they said I owe them £90. And they say it goes back to 1991. What did you owe them? I said, I don't remember buying anything in 1991 that was that much or anything like that much. I said, well, even if you did, they wouldn't be able to chase you for it now. What the hell are they on about? So I dropped them a line. And two days later, we refer to your recent request. We are unable to provide any further details. We've closed our file. They've done the damage already. Luckily, the Financial Services Authority have just taken over uh, with their ombudsman scheme uh, dealing with outfits like this. I don't think it closed down overnight. Another kind, this is much more amusing, another kind of uh, <coughs> aggressive action. This is the straightforward, usual, you've won, you know, complete your selection. Uh, and by the way, send us 20 quid, you know, that. So a couple, a couple of weeks later, you get one of these. I'm baffled. Can you explain to me why you don't wish to qualify? Why you don't wish, you've not claimed your cash money prize? A few days ago, guaranteed, you've not done anything, so you've not responded. I cannot award you any money. Send me the 30 quid. Can't be. Right, so we've got the general prohibition, we've got misleading practices, we've got aggressive practices, and in the middle, in Annex 1, we've got a list of 31 practices that you don't have to debate whether or not they're unfair. You don't have to consider the transactional decisions, the way in which average consumers' mentalities are calculated, the way in which the average member of a targeted group might have been adversely affected, they are automatically illegal. Firstly, claiming to be part of a code of conduct when you're just not. Here's a story I'm working on right now. This is a guy that trains about two blocks from here, actually, some Jews. This is the bit that interests me. That he's claiming to be a member of the Guild of Master Craftsmen. He's just not. He's just not. He was about five years ago for a year, but no, he's not. That is a lie, a straightforward lie. There's also an interesting aspect here that he writes estimate there and quote here. Um, the lawyer near you will explain the difference between those things, but it's very important. And so we're having a little run in, but there is no doubt we've got him because he's just lying. Here is another local common criminal who, amongst a lot of other ways in which he's conning old ladies, pretending to be a member of this <coughs> certification body. This was exactly a month ago, Tuesday, April the 17th, and he's going to jail. We haven't told him how long for yet, but we've told him not to bother taking his Christmas card next week. <laughs> this list of 31 matters is going to include a practice we thought we got rid of in 1968 with the Trade Descriptions Act, which itself was based upon the Maloney Report, 1960, trying to stop a practice known as baiting and switch selling. It is where you put something in the window of your shop that you have no intention of selling. And people come in to buy it, and they say, this may have happened to you. I can't take that out of the window. Uh, they've got to wait for the guy to come to change the window dressing. There. But we got this. So you go in to buy A, and they, when they got you in the shop, they sell you B. Baiting and switch them. This is fun. Giving the impression that something can be legally sold when it can't. Wouldn't you like one of these? <laughs> What that is? That's a mobile phone jammer. You're on the train. I've spent most of my life on trains. 
And I always travel in the mobile free coach. And there's always some muppet <laughs> sharing his life and his sexual preferences with the carriage. Now, if I had one of this, I could just go, ha! And it would jam. Later on, you could ask me the question you're considering asking me, but I can't answer it in public. <laughs> Pyramid selling. Been here, done that. You know where you make money out of bringing people on. You don't actually sell anything much. Um, it just circulates the money. And if you get in early, you probably clean up. But if you don't get in within the first two weeks, you've had your money's just disappearing. Here's a lovely one that was based uh, in Devon. Connoisseur Curries. Now, I don't know anybody that fell for this. I don't believe it ever worked. But it was a brilliant thing. For your £15, you got 240 <laughs> portions of the curry of your choice and a hundred of these double-sided leaflets. And you also get a, a recipe ship in American like a recipe concocted by interesting choice of words. <laughs> Correct, Steve. Concoct a recipe on it? Yeah, that's right. Anyway. You know how these things work. You send checks to the people there, pound each, then there are five names above, and then I will receive 100 leaflets. And of course, you get more people to send in the pounds, and, you get, and it goes round and round. And of course, you will climb the five bar gate to good fortune. I don't know if it ever, believed, if it ever worked, but it was based in Seaton, in Devon. That one, how many times? Closing down sales. This is good. Claiming that products are able to facilitate winning in games of chance. Of course, the lottery. Within minutes of the national lottery being created, so this is that old, your super sore away son was carrying this advertisement with this dangerously ugly woman <laughs> who, for a mere 1995, will write you a little charm and tell you your magic numbers and send you a little bracelet, 20 quid. They were straight in. Far more elegant is this one. This is tied up with the European um, kind of... This, this one is actually targeted at the French lottery. But they do a, a mailing list um, selection. You know, they can, they can narrow it down to whatever you want. And they've got your birthday. They send you a birthday card. And it's all signed by all your friends in Europe. And then they explain that what we're going to do is combine nu numerology and we're going to guarantee that you get loads of money. Instead of relying on lady luck, we've decided to enlist the help of the boffins too. Your chances to win, combining your personal destiny number <laughs> with specially selected, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're going to send you a money off voucher. Take five pounds off the big bill we're sending you. And in case you really want to get involved, there it is. Lottery. Guaranteed to beat that 14 million to one. <laughs> Mystic Meg's sister. This is good. The magic cures. <coughs> this goes back about 15 years. This is very clever. This is a, a, like a torn off sheet of a magazine. This age is serrated. Well, not quite serrated. So it looks like it's been torn out. This is quite obviously a yellow post-it, uh, which is attached to this. And it's written in some sort of handwriting. You should try this. It really works. And it looks for all the world as if it's been torn out of a magazine. That's the other side of the page. And it says continued on page something rather there. And this is some story about some woman's first sexual experience. I read that quite a lot, I didn't. <laughs> but it came in a, in a personally addressed envelope, obviously creating the impression it's personal. Somebody you know is passing on this handy heat. So you're bound to send the money. Oh, we're going to love that. The interesting thing is that it was uh, set up in Guernsey, which of course you can see, uh, which is outside the European Union. So even with this new law, we won't be able to track more laboratories. Although we did send a reporter and a camera crew over there, and we tracked it anyway. This is something that is very recent, it's in the past couple of months. 
<clears throat> Easy night detox. You know the whole detox thing that's going on at the moment? We're all so full of that stuff. We've got to use it. We've got to get rid of it. It's got to be done somehow. How does it work? What you do is you take this tea bag <laughs> and you stick it to the soles of your feet. <laughs> and during the night, all the stuff that's in your system comes out of your system and into the tea bag. And if you don't believe me, I can prove it. <laughs> At the end of the day, it is a tea bag. <laughs> So next time you stick a tea bag <laughs> to the bottom of your feet, expect it to look like that in the morning. <laughs> I can't discuss the way we completely detox, but there we are. Good friend of mine is the Chief Prosecuting Officer at Brent Trading Standards, and you'll be delighted to hear that they turned them in at Christmas time, got them fined 3K and another 3K cost. Quite right, too. <coughs> Offering a commercial practice, you know this stuff where it just doesn't happen. You get these sort of things. You have done it, Mr. Hill. But actually what it says is, <coughs> please follow the instructions. If you return the wizard and wizard and the first by choose it as required, will be able to declare for the record. You have done it, Mr. Hill. <laughs> but they fall for it. Yeah, look. We've done stories over the past year or so of people who have housefuls of correspondence and crap jewellery believing this stuff. Perhaps the demise of the extended family, don't get very much mail, nice to see the postman call, fall for anything. The last one we did uh, was somebody handling an estate, or their, their mother's estate, and she'd spent 35000 English pounds on scams like that. It's all there. But that's what they say. This, where they give you this whole range of stuff, you're guaranteed to get one of them. The lower is at less of a range, and there, it's perfectly clear that there's one car and a million cheap mobile phones and if you get one of those and of course you will you can't have it unless you sign up for a year's contract saying it's free when it's not last year um, the last of these I think was closed down these are called matrix schemes the idea was you bought some junk didn't cost much and you would get a free iPod or top of the range mobile or something but you wouldn't. They were just selling junk. The reason you wouldn't is that the deal was that when your name came to the top of the list, you would get the iPod. But there had to be a hundred people on the list to get you to the top of the list. So you simply weren't going to get it. They were known as matrix schemes. You close them all down, or most of them. This is a story that. Uh, may make it to the BBC this week. This is something I sold to the Spotlight editor yesterday. This is where you get a bill when you didn't order anything. And this is one that's very live. The uh, headmaster sent me this uh, last week. This is some CD thing that this outfit, CS Resources, insists that this school has ordered, and they simply haven't. Um, and you get it quite commonly with small and medium-sized businesses where they'll send a bill for a relatively small amount, 25 quid or something, and the lady in the front desk has probably got authority to sign a cheque for that much, won't bother checking it too much, and all you've got to do is hit a load of those companies, usually for an entry in a directory or something like that. But now they're hitting the schools, and that won't do. These we're familiar with, the foot in the door-to-door -door seller, he won't go, he comes back. This... This, pester power, encouraging the children to pester their parents to get whatever it is they want. There is to be introduced new codes of practice requirements um, on advertising, television, newsprint advertising, but it doesn't cover adverts on the internet. And uh, 
there's been a fuss recently, you may have come across it, uh, and I read that Burger King were particularly concerned that they're probably going to rebuild their site. And if you go there, you see that they really do. Welcome to the kids' website. Click on the door to enter your room and explore the objects. And when you click through, it's all here, you know, having all the way and all this stuff. I think they're going to change. I hope they do. I'll tell you what I do. I watch the lines. I think that the consumer has the right to be daft, even the right to be stupid, but has no obligation to be tricked, conned, misled, ripped off, cheated. Those things don't come together. There has to be a line beyond which commercial activity cannot be allowed to go. That's what I do. I watch the line. But I need people like you to help me. You come across stuff like this, I want to see it. I've got a pretty good network of contacts, and we can probably do something about it. I'm going to finish with a couple of contributions that I had. Uh, the first is from a woman in the room. I'm not going to identify her now, uh, because it will embarrass her, and she's easily embarrassed. When the law group were part of the business school, uh, we had what the then dean called a set trap. But we called a minder, because that's what she was. She was our minder. And she gave me this. What it says. This letter was started for women like yourself, in the hopes of bringing relief to other tired and discontented women. Unlike most chain letters, this one does not cost anything. Just send a copy of this letter to five of your friends who are really frustrated. Then bundle up your husband or boyfriend and send him to the woman whose name appears at the top of this list and add your name to the bottom of the list. When your name comes to the top, you'll receive 6,827 men. One of them is bound to be a hell of a lot better than the one you already have. Do not break this chain. One woman broke this chain and got her son of each back. At this writing, a friend of mine has already received 384 men. They buried her yesterday, <laughs> but it took three undertakers 36 hours to get the smile off her face and two days to get her legs together to close the coffin. <laughs> Hurry up and send this letter along so my name can move up. <laughs> and finally, a student of mine gave me this. Uh, as we launched the Peninsula Medical School, he says, I think you'll like this. Whoops. Please be advised that your whole trip to the operation is scheduled for. The purpose of this delicate operation is to sever the cord which connects your eyes to your rectum and hopefully get rid of your shitty outlook. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to materially affect your transactional decision, but there is beer outside. We've got about 10 seconds. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if there aren't any, we've got one over there. Yeah. Is the beer free? Yes. <laughs> we have not to you, Mr. Sutton, but you special. This man's travelled from Al Sager. Well, for you, we're calling crew. <laughs> Serious question. What, what are you going to do, Peter? Because it's all going to be sorted, and you you won't have any. We won't have a need for you on the media anymore. Will it, you? Won't it won't work. <laughs> as soon as the sun comes up, the cons come out. It's every day. Any other questions? It looks like the beer calls. <laughs> just to uh, again formally thank Peter. It's just the sort of performance I think most of us anticipated and clearly <laughs> there is a serious side to Peter but he does succeed in keeping it very well hidden. Um, I think we will uh, adjourn now for drinks I believe.
out in the foyer and then the Seymour Arms. Is that correct? That's, uh, that is correct. But again, thank you for coming and particular thanks to Peter for a, a terrific performance and congratulations. <laughs>